Hello from all of us at Stella Life, and thank you for joining us for today's installment of our Innovator Series. Today, we're going to have a special presentation from Dr. Scott Etson. Dr. Etson retired from his restorative practice of 30 years in 2008 to join the faculty of the Adams School of Dentistry at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he's been associated with the general dentistry clinic since then. He's also been a clinical instructor at the Coyce Institute for Continuing Education for the last 20 years. He is now a one-year survivor of HPV squamous cell carcinoma cancer of the tonsils and lymph nodes. He's going to share his experience with us today. And after his experience, I'm going to demonstrate how to do a thorough head and neck exam with our patients so that we can provide early detection for them. We are honored to present today, Dr. Scott Edson. Hi, my name is Dr. Scott Edson and I live in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and I'm a dentist there. I've been a dentist for 42 years, and I currently am employed at the UNC School of Dentistry, where I'm a clinical faculty there, and I have been there for the past 13 years, teaching mostly fourth year dental students. I wanna to talk to you today about a topic that's on everybody's mind these days, and that's viruses. Of course, we all know about the coronavirus, and what kind of impact it's had on our country, our economy, and our lives. And, uh, but I want to talk to you about another type of virus that affected me personally and affects hundreds of thousands of people every year. This also can be very deadly. And that virus is the human papillomavirus, or HPV. Uh, particularly the strains that are 16, 18, and some others that are now known specifically to cause cancer particularly oral cancer. So why am I so interested in this as a dentist and as a person? Well, about a year and a half ago, I was in a meeting with some of my colleagues and one of my colleagues noticed a small lump on the left side of my neck. And after the meeting, he mentioned it to me and suggested that I might want to get it checked. Well, of course I knew that someone at my age 65 years old would not normally have a lump on the side of their neck particularly since I had no other symptoms I hadn't had a cold a sore throat any kind of problems so I immediately talked to our oral pathologist who set me up an appointment same day with a head and neck surgeon over at the University of North Carolina Limeburger Cancer Center I knew this could be trouble. I went and saw him and immediately he offered to go ahead and do a biopsy and get me scheduled for a CT scan. So that biopsy came back positive for HV, HPV squamous cell carcinoma type 16 and my scan showed that it had spread down into some of my lymph nodes, somewhere between four and six lymph nodes. Um, my treatment course was recommended to be radiation and chemotherapy and I decided uh, because I wanted to do proton therapy to do that down at MD Anderson down in Houston, Texas. So I went down there and contacted their team and had the head and neck cancer team look at me uh, and do an examination and evaluation and at that time uh, their recommendation was also uh, to do six weeks of cisplatin chemotherapy and 66 grays of proton radiation <clears throat> which is carried out over a period of six and a half weeks where you go five times a week and uh, so I did that and um, it was a very brutal treatment it was uh, left me incapacitated without a sense of taste and very raw uh, mucositis uh, throughout my throat, uh, burned the outside of my neck, and left me where uh, my energy levels were completely drained. I don't tell you this so that you'll feel sorry for me. I tell you this because this is the brutal treatments that one has to go through due to this virus 
that in my case had lied dormant for at least 30 years, maybe longer, and then all of a sudden reared its ugly head in the form of squamous cell carcinoma of my tonsils. So the survival rate for HPV cancer is somewhere between 85 and 90 percent over a five-year period of time, which is significantly better than other types of oral cancer, which is caused by alcohol, smoking, other unknown factors, but mostly smoking and alcohol, whose survival rate is somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 45 percent over five years. But this is still a very dangerous cancer. So why am I telling you all this right now? What does it mean to be a dentist and to get this news? Well, I have to admit that I was fairly uninformed, even being a dentist, about this type of oral cancer. And it turns out it's one of the fastest growing cancers in males above the age of 55. Cases are diagnosed each year, and although the survival rate is high, people still lose their lives quite often over this type of cancer, along with the treatments being like I said earlier, very debilitating. So what do you need to know as a dentist? What do, what do I wish I'd known now? One, I wish I knew more about the symptoms and how to do a proper examination looking for this type of cancer. <clears throat> so the key thing, the number one way this is found was the way mine was found, and that's by a swollen lymph node that is asymptomatic. So to do a thorough lymph node exam and learn how to do that properly is one of the first things that I advise all dentists to go back and review. And also to not take the findings when you find the lymph node that is slightly swollen or abnormal, not to take that lightly. As one of the ENT doctors told me at MD Anderson, in an adult, when we see a lymph node that is swollen in the neck area, we assume it's cancer until proven otherwise, not the other way around. So learn how to do a real thorough lymph node exam, review that, and I think that'll go a long way to helping patients that may not have any idea that they have this type of cancer. A dentist is more likely to do this type of exam and see these patients more frequently than their physician. This is particularly true of men who historically don't go to their primary care physician quite as often as we should. The other thing is to ask questions. You know, do you have an unexplained hoarseness? Do you have uh, unexplained uh, feeling of something stuck in your throat? Do you have uh, an unexplained uh, earache? Those are other symptoms that are questions that you should be asking your patients each time they come in for a hygiene check or an exam. The other thing is, when you do have these patients, how can you help them? What's the best thing that you can do as a dentist to help these patients? And that would be to learn more about the supplementary products and adjunct therapies that can, are available uh, along with the um, radiation and the chemotherapy, which the doctors prescribe. Of course, at MD Anderson, they gave me a real thorough list of things that I needed or that could help me, but a lot of places that I've come up and been familiar with after I've had my treatment, uh, they don't have a thorough list of recommendations. So you need to know nutritionally what you can do to help folks out and advise. You need to, do, need to know therapeutically what you can help with some of the symptoms because the symptoms, like I said earlier, are, are very extreme. Probably the number one symptom that you're going to have when you have this type of oral cancer is from the radiation and its severe mucositis. You cannot totally avoid this, I've learned, particularly if you have base of tongue or tonsil cancer like I did. It's going to happen. So the best you can do is try to modify the severity, delay its onset, and try to help to heal once this does happen. Um, I'm not speaking in, in the, uh, on behalf of Stella Life, but Stella Life was a product that I used during my treatments that I felt like was helpful 
with the pain and the discomfort of the mucositis, along with other products that I use that were recommended in MD Anderson. So that's something to think about. Nutritionally, many of the products that are recommended are products that are full of sugar. And as we know as dentists, you know, if someone's high risk carries, and with a lot of these treatments, you're, you're changing the saliva flow, that could be very, very uh, bad for the person's uh, caries health. So I found products that were plant-based, that had no sugar, but still provided me the protein and nutrients to try to keep me from losing uh, an extreme amount of weight. Uh, as you go on with the treatments, it becomes increasingly difficult to eat any type of normal food because your throat is so raw and it's so painful to swallow and eat. So, and your body is under intense inflammatory process from the radiation and the chemotherapy. So it's burning an abnormal amount of calories each day. And you have to make up these calories as one of the most uh, common side effects of this treatment is severe weight loss. Some people lose up to a third or half their body weight uh, because they're not able to eat and require a feeding tube to be placed and that becomes uh, a real another issue to deal with. So I avoided the feeding tube by using nutritional supplements that didn't provide me with sugar but yet still provided me with enough nutritional support that I didn't lose a lot of weight. I did lose some weight. Um, the other thing is uh, to be able to um, to help with the pain. And again, I tried to avoid any of the opioids that I could. The Stellalite product did allow me to basically use gabapentin and the Stellalite mouth rinse, and that was it helped me to keep my um, oral pain under control as I went through the treatments and after the treatments. The other thing that happens is that uh, after the treatments, the radiation still is effective for up to six weeks and so you continually get worse rather than better once the treatments are over for about six weeks. During that time is when most people will lose their weight and have problems. So anything that you can do to support that with your patients is going to be helpful because you're going to also want to see them very frequently for oral exams to monitor their caries rate and their periodontal rate breakdown. And with that, of course, your support, everyone knows uh, fluoride, fluoride trays are helpful. One thing that I learned during this time was that insurance does not pay for fluoride trays. Your medical insurance does not pay for it. So the consequences of that um, can be devastating for some folks. So, you know, I would I ask all our dentists to, if the patients cannot afford it, please make them some fluoride trays and help them get the fluoride that they need because the devastating effects of tooth loss combined with already not being able to eat and swallow normally can be a lifelong devastating effect for people who do survive this disease. And another thing is that doctors that, I, that treated me have told me now that they are seeing people that are surviving it longer. But with that, the long-term side effects, such as trouble with swallowing, long-term effects from taste, um, other issues, tightness in your neck, uh, different things like that, that that create issues, are things that are all um, side effects that as dentists we need to be aware of and need to know how to help our patients with. And the last thing I want to talk about is prevention. So what can we do for our patient population? How can we help even in prevention? Because once you're infected with the HPV virus, which they say that about 90, 80 to 90 percent of people my age were infected with the HPV virus. Just like the COVID-19 virus, it doesn't affect everybody the same way. And even today, after a lot of study, we really don't know why that is. So some people are able to uh, create enough antibodies that the virus is, after a few months or a year or so, it's 
uh, removed from the body or and, and the person is no longer infected, but other people like me carry it silently for many, many years until it is able to turn into cancer. So science now in the last few years has come up with a vaccine and that vaccine is available uh, to everyone in the United States and it's actually available worldwide and particularly for young population you know before they ever get a chance to be infected by the HPV virus they can develop antibodies by using this vaccine to help to prevent ever having this awful disease come upon them in their life. We don't know if later on in life if they get it at 12 or 15 or 18. It's actually um, advocated to be used up to 25 and even older on some people after consultation with their physician. Uh, but for sure, uh, the young population, I feel like they should have every opportunity to be afforded the protection from this vaccine. Not only does HPV cause oral cancer like I had, but it also causes anal cancer, penile cancer, cervical cancer in women, and all of those, as we know, are all very deadly cancers. So let me just encourage everyone to learn more about this disease, be more aware of it, um, take it from me as a survivor, at least a one-year survivor. So I still have a long way to go. I'm still being checked every three to four months because they still cannot ensure that they've gotten rid of all the HPV in my body and that I won't have a recurrence. So it's important for everybody to be vigilant for your patients. Look for those lymph nodes. Be able to do a real thorough lymph node exam Ask the questions, you know, have you had an unexplained earache? Do you have any changes in your voice, hoarseness? Does it feel like you have some sort of popcorn kernel stuck in, kernel stuck in your throat at any time? These are all questions that I never ask, but I always ask now. I always do a thorough exam. Please encourage education through your office or wherever you practice for the advocacy to have children particularly take the HPV vaccine. Very important, anything that we can do to prevent these illnesses in, in kids down the road as they become adults is well worth it. So please, I hope I'm here to do a follow-up in about another five years. Uh, as a cancer survivor, I really appreciate life so much more now, every day. I appreciate my grandkids. I appreciate the fact that I'm in a profession that uh, gave me a lot of years of, of fun and, and enjoyment. And um, I thank everyone who's uh, listened to my video here. Uh, and I hope I've made some sort of impact in your thought process for HPV virus and their related cancers. Thank you. Have a great day. So I'm going to be demonstrating how to do a head and neck exam, which we recommend you do at every hygiene maintenance profi appointment, as well as any dental exam. So every time that we see our patients. And of course, in addition to the external head and neck exam, you'll be doing an intraoral cancer screening, which should be done every time as well. So my patient here is my husband, Gary. Hello. So he's going to uh, be our body in the chair today. So let me just ask you a question. Do you ever have any difficulty swallowing? Any no. feel like there's anything stuck in your throat no. or no hoarseness or anything like that? No. Okay, so I'm just gonna be feeling the muscles and lymph nodes of your head and neck. And I'm just feeling for any unusual lumps or bumps, which we don't usually find. And uh, it feels like a massage. But if you have any areas that feel tender, then make sure you let me know, okay? okay. So go ahead and put your head back for me. And put your head back in the chair and let's have your head a bit more up right there. So I'm going to start with going under your cheekbones and I'm going to roll right in here so I can feel everything. I'm going to feel the lymph nodes around your ears, at the back of your head as well, just to make sure everything is normal here. And that feels just fine. I'm going to feel the lymph nodes underneath your jawbone. So I'm going to feel me digging right in there so I can have a good view.
feel of everything. And I'm just going to also feel your larynx. And I'm just going to move it side to side. It should go crickety, crickety, not be fixed. And uh, go ahead and swallow for me. Okay, that feels normal. I'm just going to have you turn your head to the left. I'm going to feel these muscles along the side of your neck. And go down here. And clinicians, you want to go to where the sternocleidoid mastoid inserts right into the area in front of the ear, behind the ear, and into the shoulders and clavicle and the scapula all the way around. Okay, great. And I'm just going to now feel the lymph nodes along your collarbone. Again, we want to really roll into where the bone is all the way to where the clavicle and scapula meet right here in the corners. Now I'm just going to feel the deeper lymph nodes in the back of your neck. So I'm going to go right and left, right and left. So I don't put too much pressure on your neck as I do this. And I'm going to feel the lymph nodes on the back of your neck. And really dig in there so I can feel everything in the occipital area and then the back of the head. Okay. Everything feels normal. How does that feel to you? Don't stop on my account. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So here is a diagram of the lymph nodes that I was palpating, as you just saw, and a list of the areas that we really want to focus on. And as a clinical trainer with the JP Institute for 30 years, uh, we have been coaching our clinicians to do this every time we see a patient for their hygiene maintenance appointments, so periodontal maintenance, profi, uh, all of those patients as they return, and also during the doctor exams. I know that many people do this exam once a year, but I myself have had the experience of having patients that come in every 12 weeks and from one appointment to the next had a lesion that they didn't have for the previous appointment. So doing this on a frequent basis is the only way that we can really provide early detection for our patients. Thank you so much for joining us today. And please come back for our next installment of the Innovator Series and continue to take care of yourselves and stay safe and stay well. Thank you so much.